All right, I think we are live here. Hello to everybody. Hopefully everyone is doing well. Good afternoon. All right, we will get started here. Um, because this is this will be a video that I'm just going to be putting out there, and then anybody that has questions about this issue can come along uh, later on and watch this. So um, this one is is a study that I have done things about in the past. I originally had done a house church, uh, how to start a house church based on the King James Bible um, DVD, two DVD set thing, and um, or maybe it was a DVD and a, and a CD, I think, an audio CD. Point being, I did that years ago, took it off of YouTube. It's no longer on YouTube. I've done other things about the house church issue, church building, and all the, the debate between the two. And um, But I, you know, it's either things have been deleted or whatever else. And so I really need to get into the legal stuff because I'm not just ignorantly I hate church buildings because I've been scarred in the past from them. No, I am against church buildings for numerous reasons. Um, and so I'm going to be getting into those today. And I'm actually going to be showing a lot of the actual legal documents and things here. Um, starting out with this website here. And then I'm going to actually go to the IRS's own website. We're going to read what they say about uh, tax exempt churches. And um, again, because I get so sick and tired of not all churches are bad, Brother Brian. You know, you just don't understand. Uh, I'm I spent a lot of years researching before I ever made my first video. I'm not ignorant on these issues. Okay, so why? You have the Bible here. Thank you. Um, why does the King James Bible say nothing at all about building a church, having some kind of a, you know? place where you can go and worship and you can say it's the house of God or the church or First Baptist Church or whatever else. They, you know, you look in through the, the New Testament, there's no denominations. There are no church buildings. Nobody says, hey, did you go to church this week? Please come with me to church this week. When they go to the Jewish synagogue, um, you know, they're going there and they're getting kicked out. They're getting thrown in prison because they went. I actually got this thing in the mail here. Um, it's uh, some woman um, Karen Pansler Lamb or something, JD, I guess Justice Department or something like that. And um, if I can hold that up there, go to church. Public worship is biblical. It says, I just have a little small screen here, of course, but, um, and it's a whole thing about, you know, why you should go to church and all this other stuff. And uh, absolutely ridiculous, the article that she wrote there. And then the other thing she sent me was, uh, what's the other one here? The Spirit of Jezebel, the Seducing Doctrine of Unconditional Eternal Salvation. Uh, yeah, work salvationist. So I get some real good stuff in the mail from people. <laughs> uh, yeah. But um, we are going. I'm going to show you. Forget all the emotional stuff of, you can't speak that way against my church. My church doesn't do that, the whole thing. We don't have a steeple, the whole, the whole deal that I've dealt with over the years with these church building idolaters. I'm going to show you today how the government controls you when you become 501c3. I'm going to show you from their own documents, okay? So having said that as an introduction, we are here on this website. Um, this is hushbunny.org. This is Peter Kershaw's um, website. He wrote the book right up here. You can see in Caesar's Grip. Um, and it gets into the whole thing of 501c3, fax myths, problems, uh, incorporation, corporation soul. And he put out this big set of DVDs. I forget how many parts it was. It was a big seminar he did. A couple other guys were speaking there too. And he got into the thing of he's a paralegal, and he got into how do you legally get land, build a building, have it open to the public, how do you register it, um, 
the legality of it, the insurance, the all the different stuff that goes into it, the trustees and the, you know, who do you report to and how do you, and I remember the, one of the most significant parts of that whole seminar, he said, you know, when you get right down to it, the best thing to do is just do what they did, did in the New Testament. And that's worship at home or worship in some place and whatever in private, <laughs> because then you don't have to worry about all of this legal stuff. And that's the truth of the matter. God didn't make a mistake when he wrote his word. Okay, it wasn't some kind of a thing that the Lord got to the end and thought, oh, should have told him to build a church building. Uh, no, there's a lot more problems with church buildings than just the spiritual. Okay, the spiritual thing of the double life that a church building creates, where you do certain things when you're in church and certain things when you're not in church. I wouldn't do this. I wouldn't say this. I wouldn't tell this joke in church, but now I can tell it because I'm not in church. Uh, if you understand the New Testament, you're in the church all the time, all right? You don't leave the church because the church is the body of Christ, all right? But I'm going to give you the temporal, physical arguments why church buildings are a very bad idea. So, but you can look through this website. Like I said, hushmoney.org. You'll learn a lot from this if you really want to get into it. Different articles, you know, um, state favors uh, result in state control of the church by Peter Kershaw. Yes, they do. You you can write off your taxes and, and whatever else. It will give you the legal right to exist, and you can and you know uh, what do they say? A permission grant a permission granted is a permission which can be revoked. It's just legal. Again, we're just we're not dealing. There's no emotion with this whole thing. It's just logical argumentation. Why churches should not incorporate? Um, and again, a lot of the stuff that you're going to find on here is. Okay, we don't want to do 501c3, but how do we officially make our church building work in a way that we can legally do that? You just don't do it. It's not in the Bible, you know? So you get into the whole thing there. We're not going to go through all of it, but here we actually have, this is irs.gov. This is the IRS's website. Let me see if I can zoom in this, to make it a little bit easier to read here. Um, this is exemption requirements 501c3 organizations and i have highlighted here churches and religious organizations it says to be tax exempt under section 501c3 of the internal revenue code an organization must be organized and operated exclusively for exempt purposes set forth in section 501c3 and none of its earnings may inure to any private shareholder or individual you know a lot of the church buildings don't follow that one you know the the uh, preachers get really rich, um, but as long as it's under government supervision, it's okay. In addition, it may not be an action uh, organization, i.e. it may not attempt to influence legislation or as a substantial part of its activities, and it may not participate in any campaign activity for, for or against political candidates. You are not allowed to talk about who to vote for or anything going on in politics by their definition you say well my baptist pastor he told us to vote for trump or something or whatever then he was disobeying 501c3 and again i've known these baptists they'll talk all about we're 501c3 we're proudly incorporated or they might not say proudly and that we'll tell you who to vote for we can get away with it we can get away with it because there's not a government agent sitting in your church service but if there is you're going to be in serious trouble and a lot of these guys as they're streaming things the government can crack down on and lawfully there's nothing that they can do again lester roloff the um the whole thing of, of the schools that he had there the one for girls i think is the one that the government went after and they were you know teaching these girls certain things and whatever and the government cracked down on them and oh, oh how how dare you you can't do this well they were a parachurch ministry it wasn't a church per se but it was a ministry connected to church and therefore, they came in, they prosecuted them, and they said, hey, you can't do this. You are under our, you know, jurisdiction. If you want to be 501c3, we will tell you what to do. Period. And that's the way that it is. And right there. And like I said, if some guys, you know, I'll, I'll, tell, you, I'll tell you what to do in my church, well, then you're disobeying the government that you are registered under. 
Organizations described in Section 501c3 are commonly referred to as charitable organizations. Organizations described in Section 501c3, other than testing for public safety organizations, are eligible to receive tax deductible contributions in accordance with Code Section 107, or excuse me, 170. I mean, where's this at in the New Testament? Where's the, where are they going to the government and getting permission to get donations? From, you know, we'll just report it to the government, let them know how much we get and whatever else. It's none of the government's business. Separation of church and state. What in the world? The organiza organization must be organized or operated for the benefit of private interests, and no part of a Section 501c3 organization's net earnings may inure to the benefit of any private shareholder holder or individual. If the organization engages in an excess benefit transaction with a person having substantial influence over the organization, an excise tax may be imposed on the person and any organization managers agreeing to the transaction. Section 501c3 organizations are restricted in how much political and legislative lobbying activities they may conduct. Again, very loose definition there. I mean, what if in the future they come out and they say, here's some new rules that we're putting down on all the church buildings out there. And they say, well, we have to stand against this. This is wrong and whatever else. Could that be called uh, you know, political and legislative lobbying activities? See, again, most church buildings are disobeying the very legislation here that the IRS has imposed upon them. And they, I shouldn't say the IRS has imposed upon them. The IRS imposed it upon them because they went to the IRS to get permission to exist. So please understand that. As this government gets more tyrannical, the government will clamp its claws down on those church buildings stronger and stronger until they can't move. And they have every right to do it. <laughs> That's the whole thing. Oh, this is, this is wrong. This is tyranny and everything else. It's wrong, but they voluntarily signed up for it. So no, it's not wrong on the government's part. For a detailed discussion, see political and lobbying activities. For more information about lobbying activities by charities, see the article lobbying issues, which we're not going to go there, but for more information about political activities of charities, see blah, 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 blah. Um, but it goes into interactive training and, you know, whatever else there. Um, <clears throat> tax information for churches and religious organizations. Okay, this is another thing here on the, the deal here, the page of the IRS. Uh, churches in uh, integrated auxiliaries and conventions or associations of churches, overview of tax exempt status for churches, integrated auxiliaries and conventions or associations associations of churches exemption requirements right there's another one um i'm not going to read all of this but uh, uh again you see it there the restriction of political campaign intervention by section 501c3 tax exempt organizations um you're not allowed to talk about what's going on in the corrupt government in other words um special rules limiting irs authority to audit a church Tax information of, for charitable charitable organizations, um, you know, webinar for churches and relig religious organizations and things. So again, you're seeing it there. So um, anybody that says to you, well, you know, we can talk about what we want in church and whatever else, um, and we do and whatever. Um, there's no there's no rule, you know, that says we can't talk about politics or whatever there you go irs's website um these churches and if you get into the deeper understanding of what goes on you'll understand that by being a tax exempt organization um they actually save money on their property tax as well uh, there was literally in the town of monticello to the north of us here over into aroostook county and up there was an old methodist church building and the property tax was insane. It was a big, you know, old building. I think it was four or five thousand dollars or something, which the town of Monticello is not a very populated town or whatever. And but it was really expensive. And they but they said if you retain the 501c3 status, the four or five thousand dollar figure was if it's just private. But they said if you retain the 501c3 status, property tax was really cheap. So what does that mean? If it's a 501c3 building that it's technically federal government property i'm not joking okay again 
um, years, many years ago, I was, um, I went in to a Liberty Baptist church. I was going to a place, Liberty Baptist Church is in Ephrata, Pennsylvania, out, just outside of Ephrata, a little town called Lincoln. It was right outside of Ephrata, PA. It's still there, as far as I know. And it was 501c3. And I really didn't, I had heard a little bit about some of this stuff, but I didn't really understand it. And I remember I became a full-fledged member. You know, they did the whole right hand of fellowship thing, kind of like the Freemasons, uh, where I, <clears throat> they, they had me up front and they, they voted on whether I should be a full-fledged member and, and all this stuff. And all the members of the church came up and shook my hand, you know, and all this. And, um, you know, they laid their hands on me and prayed over me and things for the ministry and all that stuff. <clears throat> because I would go out door to door, invite people to church. Um, we went street preaching. Uh, I preached numerous times in the pulpit, taught Sunday school, whatever else. And they actually wanted me to, they were talking about me possibly becoming the senior pastor. Eventually I was single at the time, but they were talking about, you know, there was just a bunch of divorced married guys that were going there and they said, well, they shouldn't be preaching. So um, they were talking, kind of hinting at me becoming the senior pastor there because the senior pastor at the time was, he wanted to leave go back to Virginia where he was from. Uh, Guy Mosebrook was his name. And uh, anyhow, so we were there. I went to one of the meetings, the financial meetings, and they were, you know, okay, everybody. And, and they were this really official thing. And I thought, this is weird. It's like a corporation meeting at the time, I remember thinking. And it it was. <laughs> and, then, you know, this guy here, he's acting as, as the trustee, and this guy's on the, you know, this and that, whatever else. And it's okay. All in favor, say aye. You have to write down that, and you have to. You, and we, somebody said, "Well, you know, one of the other younger guys that was there, he said, why do you have to write all this down? What's who you're presenting?'" They said, so "We have to present this, the minutes of our meetings. We have to be able to present that to the government." You know, huh? And the pastor at the time, he was going out and doing hospital visitation and um, prison ministry, and they said we'd like to be able to pay for his you know, gas money and things. And, and we think that the church should be able to do this and we need to write that down and present that and whatever else and things. We want to get a special credit card so we can report this on our taxes and whatever else. And, you know, again, one of us said, well, why don't you just give them the money? And, and oh, no, we can't do it that way. Can't do it that way. It has to be reported to the government. We have to report everything to the government. And I remember one of us said, it wasn't me, it was one of the other brethren at the time that we actually start our own house church after this whole debacle of the whole thing and he said why do we have to report to the government and they said because we're 501c3 because of our 501c3 status and they and he said well where's this at in the bible and they said okay we're not bringing that up right now all right just leave the bible out of it okay i thought okay and it was kind of a oh all right, all right. <laughs> Okay. And then, you know, we're there coming in. We come in Saturday mornings. Are we going to go out door to door to invite people to church? And well, this week we have to kind of redo the library a little bit. And, and um, you know, and we have a homeschooling organization that's going to be coming for a while that they had a, a school. And then for a while, you know what, let me just get something here quick. Um, they had a, a public school. Well, I shouldn't say a public, but it was a Christian school, Liberty Baptist Church. And um, let me go down. I'm going to find the map here quick while I'm talking. They had this uh, school, and then it went belly up. They they uh, lost the money and whatever else. And um, let's see if I can find this thing. Huh. Oh, there it is. Okay. Let me bring this over this way. Okay, here we go. Here's Liberty Baptist Church. Okay, so they had this. Uh, there's Cindy Elaine going back in. This is the church I used to go to, Liberty Baptist Church. And this is kind of interesting. This is all new here. This was an old school that um, at the time it was abandoned. Um, when I was going there, but uh, um, they had all these different buildings here, and basically the the church they owned 
pretty much up into here, the whole way down in like this. And um, there's actually the pastor's name right there, Guy Mosebrook. Kind of weird why they would have that on Google Maps, but but uh, zooming in here, this is the church, and it was a it was a big one in its day, in in the glory days. It was uh, Jack Hiles preached there, Jerry Falwell preached there. Um, it had a, a lot of people going there. This back part of the church was actually a temporary wall that they were planning on tearing it down at some point in time and expanding it out, you know, and everything. But they had this was the, this was the gymnasium right here, and they had a, a bunch of big church splits and a typical Baptist, you know, thing. And the school broke up and this broke up and whatever else. And then they needed to make money. And so this, they originally had it, they were renting it out to guys with hot rods that they would come and park their cars in the big gymnasium there. And, um, and then they stopped doing that and they started to rent it out to some big homeschool organization that would bring their children there to do sports. And uh, over in here, they also had um, gardens, community gardens that people could come and they could plant things and whatever else. And it was all, you know, this constant thing. We have to report this to the government. We have to make sure we're in line and we don't want to lose our tax exempt status. And we're, they're always cutting corners to try and make money. And, you just, and I'm thinking, what does any of this have to do with the New Testament? Where's any of this stuff at? And they, they had a big charismatic church building someplace down in the town of Ephrata. And they actually said, um, we will trade you our church building for your church building because we are landlocked. We want to grow and expand and we'd like to get your church um, because, see, with when you're 501c3, you can't sell your church building. It's not yours. It belongs to the government. Again, you can look into all this stuff. It's not on the IRS website, but if you do the research into this, you get into Peter Kershaw's stuff, he will show all the legal stuff on this. You can't sell a 501c3 corporation. You can transfer ownership. That's all that you can do. So again, it's not even the people that own the thing. It's the government, federal government. And again, that's why a lot of times these guys are they're flying the, an American flag with a gold fringe. Oh, that's a military ensign. <laughs> it's crazy. But, um, yeah, so, and th this place was so dilapidated and fallen down and everything else. Uh, the one guy that uh, left along with me, eventually, um, Jesse Dulesky was his name. And uh, he was a fire alarm inspector. And he just said, you know, he went downstairs in the basement the one time. And they had the little pool station thing, you know, the little red thing that you flip down if there's a fire. And he went over and he grabbed it and he went flip like this. And the, you know, pastor at the time, he's like, oh, what are, you, what are you doing? And he said, it's not even hooked up. He said, if I was to inspect this building, he said, I would shut this building down. I would condemn it. That's how bad it was. And he, and he said, how much would it cost to bring it up to speed? And, and uh, Jesse said, about $70,000. Oh, well, you know, I, I don't know what we can do here. And, you know, we'll just hope that we can bring back the glory days and get our church building up and going again. But, but let's just want to make a point here, okay? You have land like this, okay? There's some land here, and uh, you buy that land, and you want to build a church building on it. What do you have to do? Well, here we have the uh, churchlawcenter.com. Um, we'll go down here and read some of this. This is 2019. Let me zoom in here so we can read better. Um, <clears throat> local zoning laws can have a profound effect on the shape and feel of a community. As local economies change over time, officials sometimes will update zoning laws to encourage new development and growth. Churches can sometimes find themselves in conflict with zoning rules. Chapter and verse on that one. Especially for churches that own their own building or they are or that are contemplating purchasing one, zoning needs to be among the things churches church managers keep an eye on. Church managers. Huh? First Timothy chapter three, bishops and deacons. I don't remember church managers in there. It's probably in the book of Acts somewhere. <laughs> the Federal Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act of 2000 prohibits zoning laws that discriminate against churches and other places of religious activities. 
Under the law, it is unlawful to, for most localities to adopt zoning laws that substantially burden the religious exercise of churches or other religious assemblies or institutions, absent the least restrictive means of furthering a compelling governmental interest. A compelling governmental interest? To have a church? The compelling governmental interest standard leaves open the possibility that a locality can zone against churches and other venues where large groups might gather, such as a convention hall or theater, uh, provided that the rules are ad given adequate justification and don't merely discriminate against places of worship. There are a variety of reasons why zoning laws might impact a church's operation at a particular location. And they get a, into all this stuff, but think about this. Traffic and parking concerns. I'm going to start a huge big call up here so people can come and worship me. I, I mean, Jesus. You know, yeah. And uh, call a personality, the, the call of the Demingerites or something like this. Okay. And every week we have, we have a thousand members and faithful attendance. If you do really good, you know, Jack Hiles or something, he was getting, you know, 50,000 people or whatever it was at his place. You, know, you go to Joel Osteen's place and things. I mean, it's, it's, you know, a logistical thing there. I mean, how do you get all the traffic and parking and everything else? Demand for dedicated commercial space, commercial space. You know, churches aren't buildings. They're not, you know, you have to have, just have to have commercial space. And again, these people are for church buildings. This is an anti-church building website. These people are trying to help people build church buildings. That's why I say the whole thing's a scam. Public safety concerns. Yeah, when you get 50,000 people meeting in some big stadium or some big Babel building or whatever else. Issues with sewers or water supplies. Yeah, a little bit there. For a church that is considering a purchase of land, it's important to examine existing zoning laws before making the purchase. In some cases, it may be necessary to pursue an exemption or change to existing rules to allow for the full scope of a church's planned activities. For example, if a zoning regulation prohibits any form of child care, but the church wishes to operate a Sunday school, a spe special exception may be needed. A church that finds itself faced with problematic changes to zoning laws that will affect its ability to operate in its current location and potentially harm the value of its real estate may have options for opposing the measure. And that goes into how that they counsel religious organizations. And um, Where's any of this stuff at in the New Testament? Where? And do you realize the problem that is created when you get some building someplace? And I don't care how small it is. I've seen smaller church buildings going for half a million dollars years ago. Because, see, the people that are selling the church building, they understand, hey, this thing's going to make people money. They're corporations. They're businesses. Yeah. Here we have startchurch.com. Five steps to legally start a church. Don't need to. <laughs> I don't need legal steps to start a church. Uh, and I don't start a church. I, you, when you get saved, you merely join the church of Jesus Christ. The church of the living God. That's what you join. Just so weird. But anyhow, it goes down through here. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But, you know, legally start a church in five steps. Easy steps, too. When launching a church, it is imperative that one of the first things you begin working on is establishing a solid legal foundation. The church's one foundation is the IRS in the government. <laughs> oh, I thought it was Jesus Christ, her Lord. Well, that, that's an old hymn anyhow. They're not in style anymore. Let's just get rid of that. <laughs> Let's, uh, first, you want to incorporate your church. That's important. Choose a name for your church or ministry. Next, draft and file the Articles of Incorporation with the Secretary of State. Chapter and verse? Of course not. Obtain a federal employer identification number. To receive a federal employer identification number, you can apply online on the IRS website. This number acts as a tax identification number for your organization. A little picture of a bank there because you're going to be bringing in the money. 
create and adopt bylaws tailored to your church. Not from the Bible, tailored to your church. Bylaws will be the most important document to your church outside of the Bible. <laughs> Get that pesky book away. You know, I know that they're trying to say, well, the Bible is the most important document. Well, if it was, you wouldn't have a church building. And you just this is just searches you know this isn't even kind of my in-depth i took took me years i typed in a thing how to start a, a church building irs you know 501c3 laws and rules and whatever else take me to the irs website boom right there it's not even hidden it's not even just well you know this is it's brian denninger's interpretation he was scarred in his past you know Establish policies and procedures. Policies help govern day-to-day -day activities, and they help the church remain in compliance with both state and IRS regulations. Hmm. I wonder why all the uh, churches uh, just clicked their heels and snapped to attention during the last two years. I wonder. Apply for and obtain official 501c3 tax-exempt status. Establish your church's legal foundation by securing 501c3 approval with the IRS. Why in the world would you go to one of these stinking buildings? Why do you think I've kicked them so hard over the years? And yet you get these Baptists, these rotten, stinking, lying Baptists, and they'll say, it's good to be in the house of God, amen? Amen? Yeah, yeah, you know, I'm happy to be in church this week. I love the church. The church, is, you're all stinking liar. You are a complete stinking hypocritical liar. You are in a government institution. Quit saying that you're a Bible believer in all matters of faith and practice. And Gene Kim, this little Catholic building that he meets in, and real Bible believers. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. If you follow that guy, you are a fool. Maybe you're just brand new saved and you're following because, oh, he's got 300,000 subscribers or something like that. That's a church building. It's not even his own. It's a Catholic building. You know, all these different guys. If they're in a church building, there's no New Testament. And it's a government corporation. You want to walk into one of these places? And I haven't even brought this up, but, the, you know, a lot of the time they're, they're uh, weapon-free zones. You're not even allowed to, to carry a gun or you know weapon of any kind or whatever. So the other one where they were recommending sheltering in place if somebody bad comes in, you know, grab a pair of scissors and chase them around or throw books at them if they're you know armed. Stay away from church buildings, please. Take my advice. I've been in a lot of different ones over the years. I mean, if you really want to go out and experience things, go out and visit one sometime. Right? They're social clubs. That's all that they are. There's no New Testament for them. And their favorite thing, Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. But, you know, uh, that has nothing to do with going to church. Okay, you can assemble yourself together anywhere. And I'm not, I'm not anti-fellowship. I'm not saying you shouldn't fellowship with other brethren and other believers. It's a blessed thing to get around other Christians and be able to sit down and study the Bible together, and pray together, and Whatever, it's wonderful. I'm not against that. I like meeting with other Christians, but I'm not going to go to some stinking government controlled building to do it. It's a sin. It's wickedness. I mean, who's the head of the church? Jesus Christ or the state? Hmm? Legal foundation. Establish your church's legal foundation. Other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. I thought Jesus Christ is the foundation upon which the church is built. Right there on that website, it says the church's legal foundation by securing approval with the IRS. You have one of these church buildings, you're not right with God. Plain and simple. Okay. Um, so I think that's going to be it as far as uh, what I wanted to show there on that. I want to show one article here from uh, Brother Jacob's website, the Wine Press News here. International Energy Agency calls for car-free Sundays and other ways to reduce oil use. 
uh, I guess you're not going to church on Sunday then now, are you? You know, oh, that's just going to be so terrible. What will, what will people do? Oh, no, I can't go to church on Sunday. Maybe I'll, I'll lose my salvation. I won't be able to die in a state of grace if I can't be in church every time the doors are open. Or maybe you could go back to the New Testament way of doing things. Uh, you know, I wasn't forced to do anything against my beliefs during the whole scandemic. Why? Because my church wasn't affected. So, um, yeah, that's basically going to be it for this little video here. I wanted to just put this thing out. Uh, not going to do any kind of answering questions or whatever else. Um, just wanted to put it together and just to show you the proof, the physical proof um, that this whole thing, where it comes from. And by the way, I, I was trying to think if I had this video on my channel yet, and I don't. I, I checked my uh, external hard drive, um, the too controversial for YouTube thing, and it's on there. So I did do it. It was in 2014. I did a video showing some quotes from Martin Luther way back in the 16th century, 1500s, in other words, um, way back then where he was saying about the, that the church should be subservient to the government. And, you know, it's not on YouTube anymore, so I can't recommend people watch that. But please understand what happened is with the Catholic Church, you have the temporal and the spiritual. The Catholic Church is supposed to control not only the spiritual matters of church, but also matters of state. Uh, the state is supposed to be subordinated to the spiritual. All right. The Protestants came out and they said, we're going to reform the Catholic Church, not abandon the Catholic Church, but reform it. So that's why you have Lutheranism, you have Calvinism, you have um, like a lot of the other things, the Anglicans, the Episcopalians, the Wesleyan Methodists, the, a lot of that stuff. And what they do is they kind of created a high church type of system that is connected to the state. So now you don't have Catholic knighthoods, you have, you know, Freemasons or something like that, that are part of the whole state organized structure type of a thing. And they were the ones that brought in a lot of this thing of church buildings under government authority because it's reformed Catholicism. And then you had the Anabaptist branches and whatever else where they were being persecuted by those. Um, you had Calvinists and Catholics both attacking Anabaptists. And because the Anabaptists were just saying, oh, we don't need your church buildings. We don't need your permission to do anything. And they were saying, oh, yes, you do. You know, and so that's been the fight over the last few hundred years since the Protestant Reformation. Um, but Bible believing Christians have never cared about, oh, we have to meet in some special building every Sunday from nine to 12 in the morning and then again in the evening and then Wednesday night Bible study or something. Um, that's not Bible believing Christianity. Um, and if you haven't figured it out yet, uh, being tied to a building and being there every week or whatever else and, and doing what the government tells you to do and we don't want to lose our tax-exempt status and all this stuff, uh, that's not what you're supposed to be doing, according to the New Testament. So um, my prayer is that God makes this division between his word and the traditions of men. I pray he makes it wider and wider as time goes by. And if you're going to one of these church buildings, it's already so wide you shouldn't be in there. You shouldn't be messing around with it. You need to get out of it. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins. The Bible talks about Mystery Babylon. So um, that's going to be it. Now you have a video out there if you want to share this with people. Say, you know, he went to the actual websites, showed it, where it says you're not allowed to influence political elections. Um, all the other stuff there too. The foundation of 501c3 churches is not Jesus Christ. It's the secular government. It's an abomination. It is satanic. So that is going to be it. And um, we will see you in future studies. I just got one done actually on uh, your God-given rights. It'll be out probably in a few days. I'm going to be doing some other work and things here. But uh, I have a bunch of other ones that I'm going to be talking about. Um, and so some important studies coming out but uh just a real quick thing update on my back it's getting pretty much back to normal again um so thank you to everybody out there for your prayers that really does mean a lot to me and um so 
Um, we will see it in upcoming videos. Please, please stay away from church buildings. Okay, so see you later.